Last night, Dr. Brown responded to my presentation, still unanswered with a video presentation of his own. And again, I will thank him for engaging, allowing the conversation to proceed. Dr. Brown seems to be worried that this conversation will go on and on for years. I have a feeling that that's not going to happen. You see, it's not about me. It's not about Dr. Brown. It's about you and God's truth. Dr. Brown says, read the Bible. And that is exactly the same thing what I say. Read the Bible. But go back to the world before Jesus. How would a Jew have read the Bible before Jesus came on the scene? What would have been his worldview? Read the Jewish Bible, draw out a worldview on the basis of the Jewish Bible alone. Put Jesus and Christian theology aside and draw a worldview from the Bible itself. Don't listen to what the rabbis say. Don't listen to what the missionaries say. In this presentation, I don't find it necessary to respond in detail to what Dr. Brown added to the conversation in his last presentation. I will just be asking you a few questions because again, it's not about me, it's not about Dr. Brown, it's about you and God's word. Turn to Zechariah chapter six, verses nine through 15, and ask yourself a simple question. If this verse is messianic, if this passage is messianic, and if the author is trying to highlight this passage, what message is he trying to tell you? Is he trying to tell you that the Messiah will be someone who builds a temple? He will be a temple builder? Or is the author trying to tell you that the Messiah will be someone who dies for your sins? Read the Bible. Come to your own conclusions. Question number two. Genesis 18, Exodus 24, 10, Numbers 12, 8. Why is it that the author didn't do anything to tell you that these are teachings on the subject of directing your worship. Why did the author leave that for the Christian theologians? Why did he ask, wait for the Christian theologians to come and tell you that these verses are teachings on those subjects? Question number three. Where does the Bible say that the blood sacrifices of Leviticus point to something, point to anything, point to something better or bigger? Why did the author not say that? Another question. Why is it that the Day of Atonement, which is introduced in Leviticus chapter 16, the opening verses of the chapter don't open with, listen people, if you need to repair your relationship with God, just follow these instructions. That's not what it says. If you look in the Bible, it says, this is the correct way for the high priest to enter the Holy of Holies. Why? Why isn't this passage introduced as a teaching on the subject of how to repair your relationship with God. Why is it, another question, why is it that the author of scripture never, never came out and said, there is no remission for sin without the shedding of blood? The author knows how to say things. He knows how to get points across. He knows how to make things clear. Why is it that that concept is nowhere to be found in the Bible? Why not? Why did the author not say that? I want to draw your attention to two verses in the book of Proverbs, chapter 15, verse 8, and chapter 21, verse 27. In both of those passages, the Bible tells us the offerings of the wicked are an abomination. Okay, you know what that means? That means that if you're going to bring an offering, if you're going to bring a blood offering in the temple, you're going to have to change your status from wicked to righteous before you bring that offering. How are you going to do that? How are you going to change your status from wicked to righteous without a blood offering before you bring that blood offering? So again, let's remind you my first question in my previous presentations was simply, which one of us is a Christianity or Judaism that is imposing its theology on the Bible? Only one of us is reading the Bible with the authorial intent, looking to the author to tell us what is the message and the other one is trying to impose theology on the Bible. And again, I encourage you, read the Bible, try to read the Bible as a Jew would have read it before Jesus came on the scene. And I trust that you will concur, you will agree with a former Christian, a man who risked his life for Christianity, and he told me, the Bible, the Jewish Bible, is the most powerful counter-missionary book ever published. 
Let me move on to the second question that I spoke about in the previous presentations. I spoke about the question of directing our devotion, the love that the Jewish people have for God. I just want to clarify one detail. When the missionary is knocking on your door, he is not trying to tell you to love the God that you already love more powerfully, more strongly, put batteries into that love. He's trying to introduce a new love, a love that your heart never knew, a magnetism, an attraction that didn't draw your heart beforehand. So again, it's not a matter of taking that same attraction, that same magnetism, and infusing it with more power. It's introducing a new magnetism, a new attraction to your heart. That is idolatry. Now, as it related to my third question, my third question was about Dr. Brown's contradiction as it relates to the Messianic prophecies. So Dr. Brown gave us a slew of quotations from scripture, and he said that my quotations, the ones that I presented, are not relevant to the subject, or at least three out of the four are not relevant to the subject. You know, you decide. I'll read the, the numbers, the chapter and verses slowly to you so you can come to your own conclusions. The verses that I quoted as they relate to the restoration of the sacrifices are Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7, chapter 60, verse 7, Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 40 and 41, and Malachi chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Dr. Brown quoted Isaiah chapter 30, verse 26, chapter 33, verse 24, chapter 53, verses 4 and 5, chapter 57, verses 18 and 19. In the book of Jeremiah, Dr. Brown quoted chapter 30, verse 17, chapter 33, verse 6, and Malachi chapter 4, verse 2. Now again, you do your homework. You read the Bible, because again, it's not about me, it's not about Dr. Brown. Ask yourself, what was the author, look at all the verses, put them all on the table before you. What was the author trying to tell you with all of these verses? Was he trying to tell you that the way you're going to identify the Messiah is by, ha by when you see someone healing a blind man that will help you identify the Messiah? Or is the author perhaps telling you that when the Messiah comes and when the Messianic age will be here, we will see the sacrifices restore, restored to the temple in Jerusalem? It's not about me, it's not about Dr. Brown. You read the verses, come to your own conclusions. Dr. Brown spends a lot of time arguing, why don't I debate him in a live format? I wrote at length about this many times. The first time I met him, 15 years ago, I told him I will not debate him. My responsibility is not to entertain. My responsibility is to educate. I try to keep my personality out of this as much as possible. I encourage you to read what I wrote. The purpose of all of this is I didn't even want to make these videos. The only reason I wrote a comprehensive refutation to every argument that Dr. Brown raised. There's not one argument that I did not respond to in writing. You could take that yourself quietly when no one's distracting, read it, decide for yourself if my arguments hold water, if they make sense, if they talk to your heart. You don't have to get back to me. It's not my business. It's your business between you and God. The purpose of these videos is simply because Dr. Brown has dismissed my writings for all these years. For the past 10 years, he didn't share any of his answers about my writings to the, with the public. So he has a choice. He could say, my writings are meaningless. My writings are meaningless. Ignore them. But to tell the public that my writings are meaningful and my questions are real and that they deserve answers, but he won't share those answers with the public unless I agree to a formal debate, is cheating the public. The public, if these questions are real, the public deserves answers. You could choose whatever format you choose to publicize your answers. That's your business, Dr. Brown. But if the questions are real, then the truth seeker deserves answers.